Hello, I am here on location in Louisiana with Andrew of Rolaison Distillery. Um, so, uh, Andrew, first question. Um, like, who, who are you and how did you come to run a distillery? Uh, well, I'm Andrew Lofeld. I'm uh, the oh. owner and head distiller of Rulaison Distilling. Mm -hmm. um, my background, so uh, we've, we've been open here for about uh, a little over five years now. And prior to this, I was working in whiskey. I was one of the production guys at Kings County Distillery up in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was there for a few years and then jumped around a few different distilleries before that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been in the industry for, gosh, I guess about 10 years now, mm -hmm. mostly sticking to rum, you know, started out in whiskey and what else would you like to know? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah, why, okay, well, so I've, uh, there are a couple of distilleries around the New Orleans area that mm -hmm. make rum, but most of them also do like some whiskey on the side, they do mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. some vodka, I just realized we never turned the AC off, but that's okay, we're going to carry on because, uh, direct cinema and the truth and all that. Um, and they do, they do some gin or some whiskey or something like that. Mm -hmm. Y'all are pretty much just rum and yes. rum based stuff. Yes. So sure. why why put all the chips go well, all in on rum? So we're we're very, you know, we're we're very rum specific for sure. And that I mean I I feel like a lot of distilleries kind of run the gamut in terms of spirit. So you you know you there I, I feel like I had seen so many doing the, you know, we we do our vodka, gin, and rum while our whiskey's aging, and you know they, they have to sell all these things, but their focus is really on this other thing. And we really wanted to be, you know, as intentioned as possible and to deep dive, you know, into one specific spirit so we can really uh, you know kind of expand on that as much as possible rather than trying to hit so many different spirits and you know not really dive too deeply into any one. So right. We're I mean, very much committed to rum here. You do have a little sure. bit of advantage in that over, over say, the whiskey people because mm -hmm. you don't have to age uh, rum in the exactly, same way. It, yes. It's kind of, I mean, you could sell White Dog, but most people aren't going to be interested in, in buying it. So, but unaged rum is actually yeah. pretty nice. I mean, as, that, that was definitely a big, big allure coming into it. You know, I, I had, you know, seen with uh, the whiskey side of things just that. You know, it, it is such a struggle to sell white dog, moonshine, you know, mm -hmm. you know corn whiskey, whatever he, you know your your flavor of the day is. Uh, but yeah, so that that was definitely appealing. Uh, that you can have a white rum that's an unaged white rum and have still a lot of distinctive flavor and have people that'll actually want to try it. And then the other big part was, you know, while while I was up in New York, I, I was able to try. Uh, a lot of different rums. Yeah. Just saw that there's, you know, there's so much rum out there. There's, you know, it's such a diverse category, uh, and we don't really have a lot of that diversity in the states. Or just, you know, most people haven't really interacted too much, too deeply in the rum category. I mean, like 95% of rum consumed is Bacardi or Captain Morgan. So it's to see yeah. that, and then especially we have such a a large sugarcane industry in the U.S., but we didn't really have the rum industry that usually goes hand in hand with that. Hmm. You know, it's really unsettling. I mean, we, we, well, I mean, historically we used to, but it's mm. a long, dark history of rum in the U.S. It's there. I mean, our first, one of our first big industries in the in the in the in the Boston area was rum production and triangle mm. trade and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. um, that was. I mean, one thing I can, a mean question I can say is, that's the like the Boston area. Y'all are right. like New Orleans. So right. why why a rum distillery in New Orleans instead of, I mean, it's, why, why can't people just buy all their rum from Privateer and have that history behind it? Well, well, yeah, I mean, there's that too, but it's also, I mean, there is the, you know, the distilling history in New Orleans. There's definitely, there, there were a lot not like super well-known rum distilleries, but there's a good bit of them uh, back in the day, pre-prohibition. Um, but the big thing about it, at least, you know, for me is we, we have the sugarcane industry, you know, Louisiana and Florida, you know, Texas a little bit, um, grow sugarcane. And, you know, we have this, you know, agricultural product right at hand, right here. You know, if you go just 20 minutes outside of the city, you'll see sugarcane. Hmm. And, 
you know, it's very, very important for me specifically to, to be close to where our ingredients are, be able to interact with the people growing our ingredients, processing them. Um, and, you know, being down here, we can get, you know, types of products that you can't get anywhere else in the country. All right. So, so this is this is big, right? Because um, like privateer, everyone else has to source molasses from somewhere else, mm -hmm. um, the islands or or from here, or wherever. But um, y'all can basically drive uh, drive down the roads roadways, go to a sugar mill, and, and kind of I don't know, like ask them for Do you have any spare? You, you're mol molasses based, right? Yes. Um, yeah. For the every, bulk of everything it. so far has been molasses based. Uh, we've done some cane juice based Ooh, runs okay. as well. Uh, so we've done uh, some small can runs. I, can I buy some? No, you can't. Yeah. Uh, we're we are out of it. Uh, we haven't been able to do it just through the pandemic because we had a lot of other things to worry about. But mm -hmm. I'm very hopeful for this harvest season uh, to be able to do some more agricole. Um, but yeah, so we you know we've we've done agricole before. We have one of our newest products, which you have in front of you, is uh, a cane juice based aperitif. And um, so this is this is Mistel style, right? Yes, this exactly. Is, so it's like um so it's like a, a Pinot de Charnes. Uh, you know, you're spiking uh, grape must grape juice with cognac. In this case, we're basically spiking fresh cane juice with cane juice spirit is that yeah right? so with this one um, we're using um, a cane based neutral spirit uh, for this batch debating on whether we go into the rum world for for the di uh, for the distillate for it in future batches mm -hmm. but I, I really like the neutrality for that one you know our other the rest of our rums are very full flavored very you know um, high ester generally mm -hmm. so we didn't want to combat that you know have two kind of combating flavors right. we really wanted the cane to be at the forefront for for this product so that's nice and there are a couple of botanicals in here yeah which, we, um, we use about a dozen different botanicals to just round out the flavor profile it's a quina so one of the main bitterances is cinchona bark um, you know quinine bark quina uh, it's really nice it's not as sweet as you would think it would be mm -hmm. um, I could see like old Frenchmen smoking on the porch and you know you know unbuttoning their shirts down to the third button going ah this is the best yeah this i mean good definitely stuff. definitely nice zipper on ice for sure um okay so this is but right now this is the only the only cane juice kind of base thing you've got all right. the rest of these are molasses exactly um that's so while i'm sort of uh lining these up that's interesting about the history of of because okay so you have the cane industry here the american mm -hmm. cane industry here and I had not thought about there being a history of like dis rum distilling, and because mm -hmm. usually you, I, you associate where there where there's cane, there's there's rum being made, mm -hmm. but and there's a history here of that. But um, I didn't know. So can you tell me? More, can you educate me? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, ignoramus that I am. I can, I can do some you know hot 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 topics, hot facts, um, or fast facts. Um, so New Orleans was was founded in the early early 1700s. You know the first um, right like settlers to the area were like 1714, 1790, uh, 1719 around there, and they made several attempts at growing sugarcane kind of throughout that time right. um, and throughout the early and mid 1700s. Uh, but money. Lots right, of right. I made. mean, there's. It, it was a big industry in the Caribbean. They, you know, they're they're just really starting to explore that. You know, uh, the land all along the Gulf Coast. You know, they would find rivers and travel upstream, and that's you know the you know New Orleans was kind of that like fort area to as like a kind of a placement into you know the actual Middle America. Um, and they made several attempts, but you know the climate is a little bit different, and especially yeah. back then was you know you different. You have like frosts the... here on occasion, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's hard to grow cane. But exactly, sorry, please keep going. Um, and so they made several attempts, and it wasn't until actual cane growers um, were able to you know plant it. And there's actually so the from what as far as I can read or I had read the first instance of successfully grown cane in Louisiana was actually from uh, Jesuit monks. So there is a Jesuit monastery in, you know, in the French Quarter, or just outside the French Quarter, 
and they had you know monasteries uh, all across the world, and one mm -hmm. being in Santo Domingo, and the brothers there sent like a care package of sugarcane and citrus trees to their brothers here in New Orleans. And as far as I can tell, that was the first instance of sugarcane and citrus in Louisiana. So it's all the Jesuits' fault. Exactly. That, that Rulison is now making rum. Exactly. In... Exactly. And you can actually, it's, it's so their, I believe their, like, their grounds were kind of where our central business district was. And what's really interesting is they, you know, it was only, you know, a decade and a half later that they were kicked out of the country. And, uh, so that's the first instance of sugarcane itself, but then they're of growing sugarcane specifically for sugar. Well, uh, you have to zoom another 40 years after that. Um, the first successful boiling of sugarcane juice and crystallizing was, I believe, 1794. Okay. So you know, revolution happens. We can't get uh, molasses from the Caribbean anymore because mm -hmm. <laughs> that still belongs to the British. Exactly. But, right. So, so right after that, someone in New Orleans is like, "Hey, we can make money off of, you know, well, making sugar out of this stuff." You can even. Uh, what's really interesting is like winding back great. even before that. There's, uh, you know, in in the colonies, there was uh, my my dates are so rusty, but there was the the molasses act where they would basically tax any molasses that wasn't British in origin, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's one of the first like sticking ironically, sticking points for the colonies because they liked French molasses better or you know, Spanish molasses better, whatever it was. They didn't like the British stuff. Uh, and that was one of their first kind of you know, points where we didn't like that whole taxation without representation thing. And uh, so yeah, so then no longer, they were already barred from other countries' molasses. And then on top of that, after the, the revolution, yeah, they couldn't get molasses from there as well. But then you got you got cane growing around Louisiana, you know, south. So exactly. suddenly, you know, you can get sugar from. That. That's that's actually very cool. I never thought of that. Yeah. So 17, uh, 1794 was the first, um, you know, successful crystallization, and I believe in seventeen ninety five was when they did their first distillation. As soon as they saw that they were able to do so, it, they bought their distilling equipment. And, someone ran down with pot stills, and they were already making hooch. Okay, that's 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 great. So, seven, so right after the revolution, basically, you had people in around this area, you know, making rum. So there's this entire second history of American rum distillation that is kind of happening around this area, um, which is super neat. And I never, sorry, I shouldn't be bugging you about historical no, facts. I should be giving you chances to plug your product. Can we no. talk about? Oh no, I mean, I love I love the nerdy history side of things as well. So so it's so it's not just people like. You know, inventing, trying to invent a bunch of new, like they are plugging into a history that was already here and an industry that was already here before, uh, beforehand, uh, really before prohibition, I guess. So let's talk about let's talk about your rums finally. Yeah. Um, uh, these are molasses based, and uh, as I think I mentioned before, you're able to sound kind of source the molasses locally. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the really important thing, on top of local, is we're getting it, we're, we're sourcing it direct. So we work directly with a mill mm -hmm. just about 60 miles to the west of here uh, for all of our molasses. All of our molasses comes from that same mill. Okay. So all that's the same, and it's all going through these pot stills. Mm -hmm. There's five of them. They aren't, they aren't daisy chain, right? It's no, no. So they... Quintuple district. All these are sort of so the, sourcing that tall sucker on the back. Exactly. So the first four over here... Um, they collectively work as one distillation. So we, we basically could do the same thing running on a 100-gallon pot, but we have four 25-gallon pots. Uh, we, basically, we do a 90-gallon fermentation, so we take that liquid and split it up four ways, and those together do that first distillation. Mm -hmm. And then the liquid from there gets put on the last still. And I'm not sure again. if you can see, because I set up the camera badly, but there, uh, th there's distillation going on right now, there's a bunch of bottles with hoses feeding into them. Um, and so that, that down there that I'm pointing to that you can't see is, uh, is what's going to be going into the, the storage tanks or, or the barrels. Um, it does have a, a column on top, but I think the, you said the, the plates were out Yes, right the now. column is confusing. Uh, we originally got the column, uh, the two plate sections, when we were running hand sanitizer because we needed a little 
extra bump up and proof to, mm -hmm. to get to where we needed to. Uh, so after we were done with that, I removed the plates and did some experimenting back and forth around our original height on the column or the added, you know, about eight inch or 12 inch section mm -hmm. of pipe. And I liked just like the touch of lightness that it, it brought through. Uh, so not too much of a difference between that, but. Okay. So yeah, so, confusing, but pure pot. Right. Um, and so, so all that's all that's the same on all of these. There's a you mentioned a little bit of a difference in fermentation between, mm -hmm. like, uh, well, let's talk about the unaged, the two unaged rums. I've got the, the standard at forty four percent alcohol and the overproof at fifty seven point five, which is actually overproof, mm -hmm. uh, half a half a percent overproof. Point three five percent. Yes. Yeah. If we're going by the British system, right? Which, um, yeah. So. So it's not uh, the it's not just the same thing at slightly higher strength, although it's it's they're rela closely related. So and the mm -hmm. difference is the yeast, the fermentation. Is that uh, so? Both. So we we have two different yeast strains that we use for our fermentations, and both both of our rums see both of those yeast strains, but in different proportions. Uh, the first is about a 50-50 split between the two, and then the overproof skews a little bit towards the second, uh, and then. Before that as well, that type of molasses that we're getting getting in, we get it direct from the mill, mm -hmm. and we get what's called second run molasses, or B molasses. Uh, so it comes from the middle of the sugar making process rather than blackstrap, which gets refined once or twice more uh, through the mill. So we're, we're starting off with that molasses, and then on those, our fermentations differ a little bit. Our average is about a 10 day fermentation. Um, but then we'll go even longer on the overproof. We'll do about 20 to 25 days. Okay, so Okay, 25 days ferment in, in Louisiana is mm -hmm. is pretty impressive um, And they do, they do nose differently. So there's I'm getting a lot of kind of bubblegummy stuff mm. Like bubblegummy fruity nice things on the yeah standard. I mean they're different also just because this is stronger, but um but even if you added uh, like a little bit of water down to the same proof on there, mm -hmm. you definitely it would know it's different. Yeah, the over the overproof is comes across as like earthy or grungier. There's a there's a minerality to this that uh, but it's not like wet stones or it's more like almost a clay thing. Um, I really like that clay as a descriptor. That's that's a fun one. Um, I, I you know I'll use that in mezcal and stuff. I don't mm -hmm. usually use it in. I mentioned this to you when we were chatting, but. In some ways, the, the nose on, and the, the pal and the overproof reminds me a little bit of Le Galleon in Martinique, which is the only um, molasses-based rum distillery left mm -hmm, down mm -hmm. there. If you remind me, I'll send you down a little little sample bottle because it's, it's fun stuff. Uh, but even then, like like this is what it, what I like about what you're doing is these don't smell like they're trying to be Jamaica or mm -hmm. um, or you know Cuba or any of like yeah. this just smells like its own thing. I mean, I'm I'm all about high ester rums, you know, and they, these are both, you know, definitely high on the ester scale. But I'm also, you know, very much about kind of pushing what we, you know, we're working with locally to to the extreme. You know, how can I make it as expressive as possible in its own right, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, trying to replicate any one thing. So it's it's definitely high ester, but yeah, totally different esters than you would typically see uh, in. And it does, average it does show a, a lot of terroir. Mm -hmm. There's um, it has a sense of place, like, uh, which is you don't. How do I put this? Um, in a lot of molasses space rums, there's there's sometimes a you can kind of edge away from the importance of where you're getting your molasses. So it's right. it's all coming from Guyana, well, but it doesn't matter because it's all well, really. I mean, and it's uh, like the dirty but, little secret of the rum industry that most islands can't support. The amount of molasses that they're using so mm -hmm. a lot of the time it gets sourced from you know pretty much wherever it's cheapest mm -hmm. but you know you see it sometimes coming from the states you know i know our our mill and some of the other mills will sometimes supply you know rum distilleries in the caribbean or you'll see it from brazil or you know, wherever yeah. so but yeah you are again driving down the road and it kind of it kind of shows it's um uh there's a there's a there's a vibrancy to, and, and I don't want to be trash talking other uh, rum distilleries, but there's a there's a sense of character and place here that is not 
um, common even among distilleries that I really really like. So I mean, and and the, the know, big kudos. part of it is the the yeast too. You know that's it's a big factor that especially on our whites because they're unaged white rum. You know you you get a lot more flavor contribution coming from the yeast, and we specifically picked very you know high ester producing yeasts um, to give us that flavor profile. So you know that we use. A Belgian strain, which is very much more like brighter citrus, mm -hmm. that like bumble, like spicy bubblegum kind of clovey thing. Uh, and then with the second, with the overproof, you see a lot more of our second strain, uh, Britannomyces, which is very earthy and loamy and smoky and you know has some fun kind of florals. Mm. And okay, and the, the H one, I don't want to ask you about um, uh, barrel regimens too much because uh, it <laughs> that would be very much in, involved, but so roughly it's three years, have, you know, minimum three years old, is that right, or average? Um, we're looking at a minimum of three. We don't have any age statements on ours right now, mm -hmm. but with the pandemic, we'd actually been able to push our, you know, our aging regimen a little bit older, so we're looking, I think it was at least three on that most recent plan. And you're, um, so even here, like, I'm getting, I mean, there's obviously the vanilla kind of aspects going on, but there's also, like, um, uh, there's a lot of fennel. There's some floral touches in here, like, like, like uh, citrus blossom, honey, something like mm. that. I always get like a darker, like I always think of like darker florals when I'm like that, like orris root kind mm. of violet kind of undertones, which I I see, and sometimes I see like I always debate if like it's a it's a house you know house style thing or a regional style thing yeah. as well, because I sometimes see that kind of like darker note in a lot of others or in some of the others around here. So it's fun to see kind of how it'll go along and develop as our industry develops yeah. in the region too. Yes, so I mean, again, kudos because, I mean, often, especially with younger rums, I feel like there's, how do I put that? There's a little bit of a dumb period. Like they, you throw them in a barrel and at first the, the barrel kind of swamp, swamps the disc a little, little bit. You don't, you, you mostly just go get those notes. But you hear, this is not, super old yet, but you're already getting the distillate kind of punching through. You're getting what in wine we would call tertiary notes. Mm -hmm. the, the stuff that isn't exactly, you know, from the distillate, but it's not exactly from the oak either. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're distinct. They're not like, you know, again, Jamaica or Barbados or, um, or Boston for that matter. Um, I think a, a big thing with with that and us, Sorry. you know, uh, we're we're very intentional on our proofs going in the barrel. Yeah. You know, I'm all about low proof barrel aging. You know, so many rums go in, you know, 140, 150, 160 proof, and you lose so much. You know, it takes a lot longer too to develop those kind of characteristics. Um, well, one because you're not as affected by oxygen at those mm -hmm. higher proofs, and then you're also talking about um, right. Diluting all those flavors over a larger volume right. by diluting a lot more, so we're we're in it pretty much one uh, at one ten or below for all of our right. barrel aging. And no virgin oak on this, right? Correct. It's, right. it's all, all secondary it's, stuff. Exactly. It's yeah. all used oak, primarily bourbon. We've that one I think is our first batch that has a touch of rye uh, rye barrels that go mm. into it. Fun. Uh, but mostly mostly bourbon and rye barrels um, that we've got over it's, here. It's good. I like this. 47% uh, was it? 47%. And then you have a, a, a fun liqueur whose name I've totally forgotten. It's our Amer. So the, you know, the French, you know, just like Amaro in Italian, Amer is French. So for bitter, bitter, sweet. Right. So you, it's, it's, you've, got a, you've got your own rum-based Amaro here. Pretty much. And, but it's not quite like, you know, usually with Amaros, you see it a little bit lower proof. Uh, you know, around like the 30, yeah, 32 percent. Yep, this is like 43, so this yes. is serious stuff. So um, we wanted to match it kind of more with, you know, those old school French liqueurs, you know, your Chartreuse's, mm -hmm. your Benedictine, you know, Cointreau, which all, all yeah. are a little bit heftier, and you know. There's some more, like um, Amargo Valle, I think, punches up at like mm -hmm. 45 or something, but mm -hmm. yeah, this is one of the few. Oh, oh, it's really nice. Um, it's a lot lighter on the bitter stuff than you would, you would yeah. expect, um, but it's also not um, overwhelming on the kind of. So the fact that there's a there's a there's a heavier rum behind this rather than. So I've had some rum based amaros which are kind of have that kind of whipped creamy vodka mm. thing, 
that because they're coming off of um, they're coming from uh, multi-column right. distillate. But this is the, the the fact that you've got you know these things like pot distillate yeah. feeding into this is yeah. Is you, you definitely still get that rum in the character. background for sure. Uh, yeah, and it's, I, I it's, say like, yeah, it's not as desserty. Put it that way as um, as a lot of the rum based amaros that I've had. I feel like that style too when we're talking about the earthiness, the herbaceousness, you know, that kind of bright spiciness of our rums, you know, that that kind of style of Amaro or, you know, liqueur, you know, we, we kind of built that in mind. Uh, and that, and I'm just, you know, it's probably closest to Genepi if you've ever had it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was, I'm, I'm a big fan of Genepi and there's just not a lot of them commercially available in the States. So, there's definitely yeah. some inspiration trying to scratch that itch of like, I really want a Genepi. That's and also, what I, was, I was trying to think of what this reminded me of, and I was going to say, yeah, okay, you, yeah. you thank you. For, yeah, there's definitely uh, not. I mean, there's not many folks know Genepi, so it's like you know, it's kind of like these other. Ones, but. Okay, uh, I've, I've had like one. So, um, uh, okay, a couple of other questions, and I will let you fire away. Let you, um, any cool stuff coming up in the future that people can look forward to? Um, well, we're definitely, we're always running through single barrel bottlings of our barrel aged. Uh, and as we get older, they get more out there and weird and fun. Um, I've got definitely some, I've got brandy barrels tucked away. I've got some really great like red wine barrels. We've, we've done some gin barrels before. So those. So, say I'm a distributor or like a retailer. Can I give you a call? And Absolutely. say, like, I want a barrel pick of, like, Absolutely. some Bordeaux-aged rum. Well, I don't have any Bordeaux-aged, but close enough. Uh, you, sure, you definitely give me a call. I'd be happy to. Okay. Uh, and we're, we're actually available in six states, too. So a few of those, you know, the, the distributors there have gotten picks before. Mm -hmm. um, New York, uh, Florida, Illinois, Louisiana. Oh, Arkansas. you guys are in Illinois? We are. Where are you coming? Like, I not can't very, get you Not very well distributed in Illinois, you oh. know. Uh, but we're there. And um, California. Okay. Well, I will be. Uh, who are you with in Illinois? Because I'm going to bug them. It's called Liberation Distribution. Okay. I don't know them, which is maybe part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, what What are some? This is a question I, I try to throw to everyone so far. Um, what are some things you've tried recently that have, that you do not make that have impressed you? Oh, uh, that I have that I don't make. That is a great question. I feel like I am so rusty on other brands right now just because, you know, it's, I feel like it's the last two years I'm like, you know, been in a cave mm -hmm. and trying to, you know, emerge through that. Uh, and so it's like really just, just getting back into being able to go out and have fun cocktails at bars. Um, oh man, that's a great question. Okay. Well, I will. Yeah, I know. I, I've got to. I got to think on it. I will say I've got. I I do have some fun stuff that I've have uh, folks have stopped by and you know a lot of other distillers in the industry have like poked mm -hmm. their heads in and brought from over. I've got um, lots of really fun Hawaiian agricole bottles tucked away that that is are really true. cool. Another and, thing I can't get get in Illinois. Uh, and that's also another thing I was going to say is you know hoping for speaking of special products and and things in the future um, definitely want to do some more agricole next mm -hmm. harvest and I will say I also do have uh, some really out there 151 that I've got in the barrel that I'm very excited for okay but you know it's its own thing too you know uh, I I would be a customer for that provided I can buy it from um, some some retailer in Illinois so get to work on that y'all um, okay uh, last question, uh, which is more like really more of a question for you, because you now have dozens <laughs> of interested spirits nerds from around the world uh, watching this, and you get to ask us a question, Ooh. any question you want, and y'all can leave your answers down below there in the comments to help Andrew out. Um, it can be like, what is, what's your favorite, you know, sports team, what, what, you know, what favorite color, anything you want, but hopefully oh, it would be. Um, like something related to what you do. So, I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm just very, you know, single-minded, you know, I'm all about rum. So what's, what is, I mean, favorite, weirdest, what have you, um, 
rum that you'd like to see out of an American producer? Because we definitely, I feel like we don't have as much of a diversity in American rums yet. So what's what's right. the weirdest thing you want to see out of one of us? Okay, so what, what weirdness do you want to see from American rum? Because I'll do it. I'll do it. All right. I'm going to say right now, I'm, I'm hoping for more wild fermentation. I want to, I want to see what, you know, what wild yeast does to American well, cane. I'm sorry you didn't try our agricole because that's exactly what Damn we it. did. Damn it. All right. Um, okay. Well, well, thank you so much, Andrew. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, um, yeah, that's, that's about all I got. Uh, yeah. So thanks for letting me try. Well, I did pay you for these actually, but um, <laughs> thank, thank you absolutely for giving me your time and your, some of your booze. And um, I hope they can get this up soon. Thanks a lot, and uh, thanks for watching, and cheers.